Okay, so we're gonna jump into the Storm Spirit game. I just finished watching the replay for the first time and I have a couple notes and comments that I wanna make uh, that we'll discuss as we go through the replay. Uh, for the first part, we're gonna talk about Draft Tour. So you picked Storm last, which is generally a good idea. And you saw everybody except for the Alchemist. So I think it's a really good Storm game, honestly. You do really, really well versus Sven at pretty much every single stage of the game. Wind Ranger, Leshrac, Darkseer, all these heroes suffer really, really hard to your catch, uh, your magic damage, and your initiation. Um, and your team has, you know, a lot of other things that you need, right? You have your Ricky for some physical damage, the Night Stalker for physical damage as well, the Rubik, the Ogre, kind of a good uh, support duo. So I think it's a really solid Storm game. Um, and from my first impression with this game is you start out on the lane and you're a god, and then it kind of flickers and goes away and you sort of lose lose uh, track of the things that you were doing that was helping you in the early game. So we'll go ahead and get into this. Um, we'll talk about itemization and wards again. Something that I'm going to do on all of my videos, even if I've said it before in other videos, is I'm going to take every single video as its own thing. Um, and so if you continue to... Like, if every single video I talk about the fact that you don't place this Observer Ward right away, then we're going to talk about it for every single video. <clears throat> so, itemization while we're here waiting for your friend is pretty decent. I think you should skip this Iron Branch. You should get another Mantle of Intelligence and get a Fairy Fire. It's a pretty standard build. Every single mid player in High Immortal Games has been doing that build for many months now. It's the most stat efficient. It builds into the most things that you care about, gives you the most early game damage, harass, whatever, right? Cost-effective damage and stats is what you're really looking for here. So get that extra mantle, pick up that fairy fire and drop this branch, and get this damn word out. So it's fine to go for the rune, I think particularly because there's an alk. Whenever there's an alk in the game, every hero should be on runes at the minute mark. So it's good that you go. Um, unfortunately, your block doesn't really go off because you're placing this ward. Uh, which I already mentioned you should have placed before the runes. And then it takes you quite a while before you put this branch in your inventory. So it took you two minutes to put this in. And that seems like a small thing, but you know, that's 20 HP, that's a couple mana, and that's, you know, one damage on every single auto. Uh, and this, you, you end up doing this kind of thing quite a bit throughout the game, where you have items that are better than the items that are currently in your inventory, or you have empty slots and you have items in your backpack that aren't getting shuffled in. So maybe you're tunnel vision a little bit on whatever it is that you're currently doing, but make sure that any gold that you have spent, and I'm not talking about like your net worth where you have gold in the bank and you have items, but anything that you've actually spent gold on needs to be doing something for you. So people tend to get kind of lazy with this and uh, there's actually one point in the game where it costs you your life and a kill because of it. So we'll see that in a bit. So here you should be blocking, not placing this ward. Okay. So we'll watch this first wave one more time, just because I was going to watch it and let people see what's going on and then go through it. So you don't actually draw aggro here, which I think is a mistake. You should be drawing aggro. Okay, you do draw aggro a little bit. You should draw aggro again here. So your goal with drawing aggro is to keep pulling the creeps over and over and over, even if it takes you four times. You have to draw aggro four times. As long as you're not missing CS and the wave equilibrium is like this, you should be drawing aggro constantly. And this is twofold. One, you want your range creep to be in kill threshold, and two, you want to pull all of the creeps closer to your tower, particularly for uh, this range creep, which you'll end up missing because you can't really safely get there in order to secure it. Um, and I don't remember if you miss high ground or not, but anyway. So you do pull aggro here the once. Use your Q to get the CS. Like, that movement is really good. You get another CS, and again, it's like, even here, you should still be pulling aggro. Um, virtually every single last hit you ever go for as a mid or as a carry, you're going to be pulling aggro in order to 
guarantee that you get to last it in any kind of contest situation, right? Like if obviously, let's say this elk is like freaking walking around the map. You don't need to look bo bottom and draw aggro off of this fen in order to pull aggro to get to last it. Like you could just get to last it. But a good habit to get into is just pull aggro uh, whenever you win for CS. So, and because of this, the elk ends up with favorable que creep equilibrium and he has... Um, an equilibrium advantage, which basically means that he has more range creeps than you. So your wave is going to push faster than his wave does, which means unless he shoves the wave back in your favor, he controls the pace of this lane for now. Um, the best way to deal with this is pulling aggro or shoving. So you decide to pull aggro here. I would use your Q. And we'll talk about some of the like recursive damage of not having pulled aggro earlier. So if that range creep didn't get to nine, you're level two and you get to auto him like two or three times, press your Q and auto him again. Uh, and he'll end up taking like 300 points of harass or something just for going for the CS. Like you want to punish him as much as possible for walking up for this. And you do end up doing really, really well versus the Alk, but the Alk also does really well. Um, and this is one of the reasons why he's able to do well and not get as punished as he should be for this. That's a good use of your Q. And then this is a really good trade here for you. You should pop a stick and a tango as you go for this trade. That way you can remain healthy on top of it. Um, and he honestly should have as well. Like you've got this region that you're not using and you end up eating a tree there, which is okay if you're going to go wand then you want to save these branches if not then the purpose of buying these branches is twofold one for the early stats and two because it doubles the duration of your tango if you eat a tree that you plant sorry if you eat a branch so you scout the stack that's really good. It's always important versus Alk and any other mid hero, especially when you're a hero that can contest stacks really well, like Storm. You do this and see here, like you've you're bullying him for this range creep, and this is what you need to be doing. Like every time he wants this range creep, is you bully the shit out of him. You get favorable equilibrium, and something you can do on heroes that win uh, melee range trades is when people when the creeps are in this kind of a state you can walk and you don't have to click on him like you click on him here and draw aggro and i think that's actually a mistake so if you just click like over here where my mouse is and you just walk up to him for the alk there is no difference um and we can talk about like ultra high ultra high brackets in here in a second as well for him there's no difference to whether you right clicked on him to get there or if you walked up there if you clicked behind him to get there, right? All he knows is that you're coming up and he has to be careful with the queue. Um, generally, it's a bad idea to get more points in your queue than your E. Even unless you're really consistently landing them on the opponent, it's not a good idea. Um, in this lane, it ends up working out. And I think it's okay, but I would be cautious to advise you to do this in any other game. I would say generally you max overload. You get a point in Static Remnant, you get a point in Overload, you get your third point in Electric Vortex, and then you get your fourth in Overload. And then if you need to get a second point in Static Remnant, you get it at level four. Um, one exception is Ember Spirit, but we'll talk about that match, but if you ever play it. Really good movement here. Everything was flawless from your attack walking to the way you baited it. Leveling it up with four. I don't know if you're paying attention to your XP. I hope you were. Um, and then here's where you make a mistake. So. All right, you just killed him. And this is best case scenario for you. Because the creep wave is about to meet and you walk back here for some reason. I'm not sure why you walk back there. I guess you were going to go for a tango or something and you decided you didn't need to. Your goal should be to shove this wave under this tower as fast as possible as fast as humanly possible this is twofold one because it's going to allow you to do something else 
um, in the downtime that you have, whether it's go block creeps, whether it's to stack a camp, scout runes, take his stacks, whatever. Um, but the other thing is it's going to maximize the amount of XP and last hits that Alk loses out on, particularly XP here. So you end up kind of like chilling, and you should be nuking the shit out of this wave. So what happens is because you don't do it fast enough, Alk TP's in, he gets to synergize the fountain, far, or fountain region with Acid Spray. There's no creeps here, and he just gets three creeps for free. So, and then you get super lucky here. You get a nice little stack. That's good. And you immediately go really aggro on him, and you should be. Like, you have an armor advantage. You have an arcane rune. You have the level advantage. But something that you're not doing that I feel like you should be is, like, while you have this arcane rune, you should be spamming your spells. Like, shove this wave under his tower and then pressure him. Like, again, you don't ever actually have to right-click him, but you can just walk at him and threaten him with your Q, and if a kill ever becomes possible because he's, like, tanking creeps, tanking Qs, um, you can actually also hit him under his tower if you're very careful, and we'll we'll discuss that in, maybe in a bit. Remind me to message me on Discord if you want to learn about that, is how to attack people under tower without tanking tower hits. Um... So, and then, like, you shove the wave on her, and then you stop pressuring him, and you go here. And this, like, this dude is dead on my freaking screen. You're level 6? Why the hell is he not dead? Like, you don't even zip once. And you finally do. You finally kill him. That's really good. But, like, really sloppy. There's no way that this, you get away with this in a higher rank game. There's no way. Like, he's not going to be that stupid in order to stand there, and a support's going to TP and kill your ass. So, like... You also tank these creeps for some reason under the acid spray. Like, you get a kill on him, but it's really sloppy. Like, really, like, inexcusably sloppy. Okay. And now, this is where, um, like, you now own this Alk. Like, you're the Dominix, and he's your bitch. Like, you get to walk him like a dog wherever the hell you want. Again, you like kind of prioritize this instead of shoving the lane, and then you go for this rune. Which I understand you want to get the rune, but like shove the wave first and then go for the rune, especially because it was safe. Then you take your stack. But again, it's like this whole time these creep waves just kind of stacked up because they weren't killing each other, and then Alk gets to walk in and he gets to take the creep wave and get all the CS. And you've solo killed this guy twice. You took a stack, you stole his stack, and you only have six lasts more than him. Um, and your la and like in both of your last hits are very high. Like he hasn't missed hardly any creeps in neither of you, um, and he should have missed a lot of creeps because when you killed him, his tower should get shoved. And here again, like it takes you way too long to do this. Like Alka benefits from this because he gets to go and farm a camp and then be here for every last hit. You get unlucky with the runes there, but that's life. Even here, like, as he walks up, you can just pull him in a tower and hit him a few times. Like, you're not going to commit to this, but, like, you're going to harass him, you're going to force him to salve or use his ult or something, right? It's good that you're popping clarities. Um, and here, I want to talk about... Uh, game plan. So you end up getting Orchid next. You've gotten your treads already. I think that's really good. I think you can probably squeeze a magic wand into your build at some point, um, but I don't think that it should take a lot of priority this game. Like, that's kind of a... Like, I have an additional slot. What should I put it in? Uh, or what should I put in it? So right now, you are sitting really pretty. You're either top net worth or very close to it, top net worth. You have the best CS. You're level 8. Um, what is your game plan? So the way I see it is you have a couple priorities this game. You have, number one, yourself. You are your biggest priority. You want to make sure that you have the best game you can possibly have. You have um, your carry as your second priority, which is you want to make sure that he has the best game he can possibly have. And then you have the enemy cores, which you want to make sure they have the worst game that they can possibly have. Um, and so you need to find a balance between how do I help my teammates hurt their cores, and help myself all at the same time. Uh, and if I can't do one of those, which is the next, like, what's the best that I can do in, in this situation for that? I think 
um, the best thing you can be doing, which I already mentioned before, is shoving this wave under tower and then taking Alk's farm. So you shove the wave and you don't back up to your small camp, you back up to his small camp. Even if you have to buy your own observer ward, like they don't cost anything. If your supports are buying them, like tell them, hey, I want to buy some wards. And you can go and you can ward back here so you can get the vision. Like you can chase Alk around. Um, and keeping track of his ult is really big for you because if his ult ever goes down, like if he uses it and you watch him, you can kill him uh, pretty freely. So you have this enormous potential. You're the scariest hero on the map by a long shot and you kind of play a little bit too passive. So like you walk top and you help your carry get kills. I would say that's okay. But again, like, look at where you're farming, and look at where you could be farming. So we look at this, we look at free cam, or, like, they don't have any vision back here. It's like, they don't really have any heroes that threaten you. Like, what the hell is this gonna do, guy going to do with Boots Sol Ring? Are you scared of him at any point? Like, of course not. Who are you scared of? Like, you're probably scared of, like, getting shackled with Sven Ult and Leshrac there with an Alchemist Acid Spray. But it basically takes, if you have mana, it basically takes four heroes to kill you. And so you have this huge opportunity where you're two levels ahead and you can just invade and you don't, like I said, you don't actually have to kill him. But if you just take all three of these camps and you take this camp and you're shoving the tower under his wave, what's going to happen is he and the Sven, the Alk and the Sven, because they have this freaking greedy creep hitting lineup, are going to start overlapping and farm. And what is that going to make him do? They're going to say, oh my gosh, I have no camps here, 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 I have no camps anywhere. Where are creeps? That's the only thing that they're thinking about is where are creeps? So they're going to run to waves. What's our, what's in waves? Well, <laughs> waves have vision, which allows you to see the sun and see the elk, and that gives you opportunities to gank them. If they're up here trying to push this wave, they are way more gankable here than they are back here. But they're not going to be here if they can be here, because they're scared. But if they have no creeps, they're not just going to sit around and be AFK, and if they are, then like that sucks for them too. So making sure that you're taking like away their farm is doing multiple things it's giving your carry a better time because he has vision of enemy heroes or like he's just getting farm and they're not it's giving you farm because you're able to farm in areas that aren't overlapping with any of your teammates and it's taking farm away from them which is ruining their day and this is inevitably i think why in the long run you end up doing so well in the laning phase and then the next like 20 minutes it feels like the enemy team just kind of farms and not a lot gets done. So you go for this, you go for this kill on him, which I think is, I think is fair. Your jumps are a, like a little bit unpracticed. Um, you also shouldn't commit too hard after he presses ult because he does have a lot of regen. So I think instead, like if you want this kill. Um, you need to just kind of think about it faster. It's like you just kind of save pull for a long time. And like you don't die and he doesn't die, but it's just like it's a little sloppy it makes me think you're just not really a storm player and off your dota plus level you just you don't play too much so like um, that explains a little bit of the build and maybe some of the hesitancy there you're not really sure how much you can do with your mana or how much damage you have this walking to this fight is fine keeping the base also fine you get your orchid And I like your camera movement here. Like, you're really looking for a way in order to, like, mess with this Alk. And that's really, really good. This is all good. But I think, like, you don't need to back here. So you should have... You should buy a bunch more clarities than you end up doing. And if you have clarities, then what you can do is, because you have this mana regen, is, like, you can just take this camp. It's like... And take this camp. And then the... Camps are going to spawn again, and you can take them again. And then it's like, all right, awesome. I got four camps. Um, like, the wave mid is okay. You don't. There's not really a large reason to go there. Um, and this is kind of like a good, better, best situation. Like, going to this wave is fine. 
Um, unfortunately, you don't see this DD rune. It kind of uh, is unfortunate. So I would at least double check at the 14 minute mark for all the runes. And then here we talked about earlier how a lot of times you have items in your backpack that aren't doing anything but are better than items that you currently have in your inventory. So this fight, here, sorry, I'll go back to player perspective. So this fight, if you have this Staff of Wizardry there, you have a little bit more mana. And then we're also going to talk about a Storm-specific thing here, um, which is when you should jump and how you should jump. So your entrance to this fight is really good. Like, this is very good that you're actively coming up here. And then here, you jump, like, kind of in a place that he can't path. So this is a little bit sloppy and it ends up kind of costing you because like just because there's some freaking less wreck there like he's not even really going for you he just happens to get you but you should be jumping the shortest distance you can in order to accomplish your goal so your goal is to jump on him and get vortex like i don't even know if you need to jump on him in order to get this like rubik has lift well maybe he doesn't but like, before you jump here, you should be jumping to the edge of these trees. Because you know that he can't walk through the trees. So that means he has to go around them to the left, or he has to go around them to the right. Pretty unlikely he goes around them to the right, because you've got teammates there. Um, and so just jumping, like... Like, jumping here, or jumping here, gets you close enough in order to do what you want. Um, without putting you in more danger, and it conserves your mana quite a bit better. So, and then as all of this is happening, you should be thinking, okay, like, where am I going next? What do I want to do? You still have your pull-off cooldown. So you end up zipping down. And then you're scared, and you zip away. And you had a good idea here to juke in the trees, but it didn't really happen. So... This is a fight where, like, if you're a little bit more practiced on the hero, this fight goes really good. Like, you kill the, you kill the, um, what's his face? Darkseer. You kill the Darkseer, and you don't die to Storm. Um, and instead, you kind of panic a little bit, and that costs you. So, I don't want to harp on this to make you feel too bad, but this is, like, an opportunity for you to improve mechanically, and not just from a, um... I'm not sure what the word is that I'm looking for. Idea. Like, basically, your idea was correct, but mechanically, you did the wrong thing. That's what I'm trying to get at. So here, again, you're watching the map as you're dead. That's really important. I find that most people just go AFK for this. That's a really good zip. And you should pop this clarity immediately. Like, there's no reason for you not to have this clarity going. And then you do the same thing. It's like you still, even though you've had like two minutes to think about this and bought another item for some reason like you're allergic to getting these items in your inventory in fact they don't they don't ever go into your inventory until you get your kaya and it combines them and puts them in there for you um speaking of items from an itemization perspective i think bloodstone is fine most games on storm uh this game you should look at the damage type they have and realize that they basically only have physical damage right like you're gonna die most likely you're gonna die to either Storm initiating on you with Ags, or some stun into Sven um, hitting you with ult, right? So the items that I'm thinking this game for you that allow you to play the map basically however you want are Lincolns and Shivas. So if you have a Lincolns, you're not going to get blinked on by some Alquist stun going. You're not going to get stunned by some Sven. You're not going to get Windranger shackled into a tree followed up by a bunch of you know heroes right so the lincolns allows you to play really really aggressive on the map feel really safe in fights um, and it's just all around a really great item the other thing is shivas which we'll talk about um, so shivas has two main advantages for you this game so first of all is it has armor it's one of the best armor items in the game 15 armor 
It also gives you quite a bit of int, which is kind of a, a plus. Um, but the biggest thing is it slows down the attack speed of all enemies by 45, and it reduces their healing by 25%, which is really, really important versus Alk. Um, he's kind of a sustain tank, and generally, especially when he goes this like Radiance build, which is super dated, he's really dependent on his ult to keep him alive. And if you can reduce his regen by 25% just by existing, that's pretty good. Especially when you couple that with the Vessel that your Night Stalker ends up picking up. Uh, where can I find that? Here it is, Vessel. So what passively... Okay, it doesn't. Only the active does. The active reduces um, lifesteal and HP regen by 45%. So if you add those up, Alk basically doesn't have an ulti. You know, he's healing for like 20 HP a second or something in ult, which is really just not that much. And it kind of cucks the idea that Alk wants in fights, which is he wants to be tanky with a Radiance um, and have this regen. So I would be looking at Lincolns and Shivas for you. Your farm is really good, so like Bloodstone isn't bad, but I think the other two items that I mentioned help you in fights and your team in fights a lot more. So we'll talk about this go here as well. So the only thing that I want you to notice is you have no vision of anyone on the enemy team and you're jumping a support under a tower. So if you get this kill, it's pretty cool, right? It gives you some gold, gives you some levels. Maybe you get to push a tower off of it. Um, it's good. However, you don't have any vision or information that allows you to make this play, right? Like what if they're going for a smoke play? What if there's somebody sitting behind him? You, you just don't really know. So I think what you can do is you can just sit in the trees here. Like just sit in the trees for a second and just see what happens, right? Like this siege creep's about to die. If she walks up, then maybe you can get a kill here. Instead, you end up dying. Now, I'm honestly not, like, I don't want to be the kind of person who just says, oh, you died, this is a bad play, right? I want to tell you why this play is bad. And the play is not bad because you died. If you had waited in the trees and you had vision of someone and you went for this play and the enemy team just outplays the shit out of you and the slash rat gets some crazy stun and you're like, oh my gosh, I saw three heroes. What were the odds that these guys were there? It's still a good play. It just didn't work. Um, and so understanding the difference between making a bad play that works and making a good play that doesn't work is really, really important. And that was a bad play that didn't work, but it could have. But if it had worked, it still would have been a bad play. This is a much better way of doing this gank. Um, you wait in the trees off here to the right, bottom right of the minimap, and then you wait for your team to kind of do something, and it gives you some information that allows you to make this jump. And so it's a much better play, whether or not it would have been successful. Okay. Um, next kind of, because we're kind of in a random spot here, so I'm gonna talk about something else as well. So in your comment on Discord, you mentioned that you were concerned about this game getting to 30 minutes and that you would lose. So my response to that is I think you were misinformed or misunderstanding the way that your heroes scale and how the enemy team uh, does compared to you in the late game. So I would say that your team actually does really, really well versus them in the late game. I think in the like ultra hyper late game when everybody's level 30 with six slots, um, then they maybe win because they just have more cores. Uh, but that's really the only reason is the the core number there not because they have better cores the Sven and the Alk are competing for every single creep on the map So they're just not going to get all that much farm um, Especially if you guys are playing active and just kind of choking them out slowly The other thing to consider is how the enemy team kills your heroes So it is pretty hard if you guys itemize correctly for this storm to kill anybody here if your teammates get blink daggers and Ricky is like even paying attention at all, or you have a Lincolns, this Sven can never really initiate on people. You also have great kite. Like every single one of you has a dispel, a slow, sorry, has a stun, a slow, or some way of making him miss hits. Um, and so like this Sven is gonna get mega kited. And there's one or two fights here that you, you lose eventually because you get like back walled into a three-man Sven stun and he just like cleaves the hell out of all you guys 
Um, but for the most part, like in the late game, with good positioning, you guys should be fine. Alchemist is not a late game hero. He, It's this like weird misconception that I hear all the time that, that Alk is this like late game champion. Alk's timing is like 22 minutes. And he has already kind of missed his timing. Like he's already poor and broke. This isn't even great farm. Um, this is barely more farm than some anti-mages have at this time. So I think your guys' panic to go to the late game, or sorry, to end the game before it goes late, is a little bit misinformed. There's the back combo. And really what you should be more concerned about is making sure that you have items to deal with their heroes. It doesn't matter how much damage Sven has if he can't hit anyone. It is kind of what I'm getting at here. And Ricky is like one of the best late game heroes. He just becomes so elusive. He has so much damage, so much mobility. He just absolutely destroys fights. It's like he'll just ignore the Sven. He'll kill the Wind Ranger. He'll kill the Lushrak. He'll kill the Dark Seer. Like, Sven's not gonna one v five. Kind of unfortunate. He sort of died to some random damage there. So something you should be helping your team do is recognize when it's a good time to go Roche and whenever it's a good time to go Roche, especially a Storm, you should consider it. So Ricky's pretty good at taking Roche if somebody can pull him forward so he can backstab. And Night Stalker can tank. Storm's not the worst, but like he's just not really good at taking Roche. But he does really, really well with Aegis. So anytime you guys have an advantage or you want to force a fight, um, Roshan is something you should be looking for. And I don't want to go into... Roshan and all the reasons when, it, when it's a good time to Roche, but the fact that it's 23 minutes in the game and nobody has Roshed, uh, or even considered it, is a little bit a little bit surprising. Here, this is a bad play that works out, and then doesn't work out. So, it's like two of your teammates aren't there, you don't have vision, the enemy team is missing, and you guys jump in. So, I think it's fine for you guys to be bottom, as long as the expectation is, if we see our heroes, we're running away. The enemy team knows where Ricky and Ogre are, so they're going to be looking for a fight. And if they're not looking for a fight on you, then they're looking for a fight on uh, Ricky and Ogre. So wherever you see a hero, the entire enemy team is going to be there. I think they end up... Ricky gets out. Which is fortuitous. And in the past couple minutes, so I don't remember what your net worth was at like 10 minutes or something, but it was really high, like 5.3k. Like this is really, really good. Uh, I know Alk has a little bit more than you, but it is an Alk. So 5.3k is really high net worth. Um, that's like consistently higher than most mid laners have in any given, any given game. And your net worth graph does not continue to go does not continue to improve. So there should be an acceleration of farm, especially on Storm Spirit, where you're getting more and more farm. So we can go look at Alk, where his like farm kind of, uh, it improves, you know, as he gets different items, you can see it goes up a couple times. And then you can see that, of course, this is where he died. This is where he died. This is, you know, where he died. Um, but as he gets items, his net worth graph continues to curve up. And yours stays pretty straight the entire game, um, which is unfortunate because Storm's pretty, good at farming and does really, really well with items. So you end up having 531 GPM this game, which is reasonable, but I think you could have pretty easily made that 600 or 650 without a lot of effort, especially considering how well you did in the laning phase um, with farming. Like your farming was perfect, it was just your aggression that was lacking a little bit. And the game is basically over from here. So... I think you should have stayed bottom and continued to pressure. Like, you can pressure them all the way up to this tier 3, and then if they TP someone, then you can TP back. But until then, you're not going to TP back. You guys don't want to fight them. And especially now they have Aegis, that's even more relevant to not fight them and to just cut waves. So here, okay. This is, yeah, I have a note about this. So you get a regen right here, and there's a fight that goes pretty south. So they initiate on someone, 
And you guys are running. Like, Ricky's lagging behind, so it's already a little bit scuffed. So, this fight is now bad, right? Like, they killed someone, your Ricky's not there. Like, Alka's pressed ult. You have this regen rune, what can you do? It's like, you can zip down here, you can kill this creep wave, you're not gonna kill the siege creep in time, you can kill this creep wave, you can pop your regen, you can keep zipping, you can zip. Um, like, you can run, you can zip, whatever, and you can try to kill these creeps back here and completely just cut this wave. Um, you can hide in the trees. There's a lot of different options that you have here. Um, like, especially with this Night Stalker dead, there's not a situation where this fight is good. And here again, like, you're just getting so greedy for someone who doesn't matter. So, if you imagine if you hadn't made that play, both of these heroes would still be dead. Um, but if you had pushed, this wave would be dead. This wave would be dead. This wave that's about to spawn would be dead, and they couldn't do a single thing. So they end up pushing. And let's watch how much damage you could have mitigated off of that one play. So about, like, an entire wave of creeps, I don't know, four people. You guys end up team wiping here, which is fabulous. Um, I don't really have a lot to say about this. The enemy just kind of, like, overstayed their welcome. But they wouldn't have been able to do anything if you had cut all these waves, and you would still be alive and able to join this fight and be healthy for it. Farming here is all fine. Just trying to get items. You end up going for the Shivas, but I think you should have gone Shivas before BKB. Um, when I watched this the first time, I had some other friends of mine that were just in Discord with me, and we were just kind of talking about the game a little bit. Um, and like all of us agree that this BKB is just really not the best item for you. Like if you have Lincoln Shivas, it is so much harder for them to kill you than if you have Bloodstone uh, BKB. So like, I'm glad that you're willing to buy this item and you're not in some like weird. This isn't a damage item kind of spiel, but here, it's like you have BKB and what happens? Like, you get Blink stunned and it does not matter. Now, you would probably die here if you had Shivas, but if you have Lincolns, you don't die there, right? Um, and that's where it's like, you have to recognize that what, like, BKB doesn't prevent you from getting initiated on, which is how you're dying this game. Um, what BKB does is it allows you to initiate on others and not get, like, counter-initiated. And the game's over, so we will end this replay here. Um, but I think that like the overall thing you should take away is you played really, really well in the first 10 minutes. Um, you played okay in the next 20, and then like the last 16, I didn't really feel like you did a whole lot. Um, and your aggression in the early game is less than acceptable for um, for what it could have been. Um, other than that, like I don't think you need to be ashamed about this game. Your team, it's not like your team played incredibly well either, but I would say that this game went about as expected for the way that both teams played. So I'm going to end this, and I'll try to upload it.